time for Talking Tauntaun! Your Star Wars source at AIPTcomics.com Hello and welcome back to another episode of Talking Tauntauns. I am Jim Lahane and with me is no one actually this week. It's just me and I figured we've been super busy. My internet has actually not been working at all. Uh, so I'm lucky that I'm even able to get this podcast out. Uh, I needed to edit some of the audio for last week and I it took me a little while, but I finally have the audio uh, fixed for last week's episode. If you notice some inconsistencies in the audio levels, but with lack of internet, I haven't been able to do that. But for this week, I figured it would be a great time to release one of the panels that I was on at Star Wars Celebration. Uh, the panel is the Science of Attack of the Clones. Uh, it kind of follows on the Science of Star Wars theme that uh, the Star Wars Elegy folks of James Floyd and Melissa Miller had come up with. And I thought it would be fun to focus in on Attack of the Clones since that it, this is the 20th anniversary of the movie. And so uh, on the panel, uh, it was moderated by James Floyd and we had Fawn Davis, who is a prequel model maker. We also had Dr. Dre Letamendi, who is a psychologist and also a podcast host of the Arkham Sessions, uh, where she looks at the psychology of these various pop culture things like Batman, but also Star Wars. Me, uh, we had Dr. Lisa Will, who's an astrophysicist, and uh, J. Diane Dotson, who is a science fiction author and also a biologist. So it was a ton of fun to do the panel, and I highly recommend that uh, you sit and listen to it. And if you're able to go to a celebration in the future, that uh, you try to hit up some of these smaller panels um, because they are put on by fans who truly love uh, the franchise and what they're doing. So, thank you. Welcome to the Science of Attack of the Clones. Uh, I'm so glad you guys can be here. You guys chose this panel over Mando Plus, so that shows some real dedication. Uh, my name is James Floyd. I'm a freelance writer for StarWars.com and Star Wars Insider Magazine. And uh, I run a podcast called Star Wars Ologies uh, with my friend Melissa, who's going to stand up really quick. Hello. And that's where we talk about where, where science and technology and other fields of uh, geeky nerdiness stuff uh, intersect with with Star Wars, and uh, not only are we doing this today, we're going to have this recorded as a podcast episode, um, and we're doing a panel tomorrow that Melissa's hosting called Galad Galactic Critters, Big and Small, um, and so you can come check that out too. But let's go down the line first and introduce our panelists. Uh, we can go either way. Yes, I'll start. Uh, my name is Fawn Davis. I am a uh, visual effects artist. I specialize in miniatures and special effects on the practical side of the industry. Uh, I worked on the Star Wars special editions as well as the prequels and, of course, Attack of the Clones. I'm J. Diane Dotson. I am a science fiction and fantasy author, and I'm also a biologist, and I'm so happy to see all of you. Thank you for coming. I'm Dr. Lisa Will. I'm a professor of physics and astronomy at San Diego City College and the resident astronomer at the Fleet Science Center in Balboa Park. Good morning. I'm Dr. Dre Letamendi. I'm a clinical psychologist at UCLA. I also um, do consulting and writing for Fandom, for Warner Brothers, for Disney Plus, and I uh, also have a podcast called The Arkham Sessions, which started out as The Psychology of Batman, but actually starting this weekend, it will be about the psychology of Star Wars. I am Jim Lahane. I am a paleontologist and a geologist, and I love to look at the geology or paleontology in pop culture and see you kind of use that as a teaching tool um, to tell you what everything that's wrong in the movies um, <laughs> and use that to teach what should be there or what could be there. Yeah, one. Don't talk over my clapping. 
<laughs> One of the things that Jim taught me is we in Rogue One where the guy picks up the, the crystals and licks it and says salt. The Last Jedi. The Last Jedi. That's right. Last I know my movies. Um, anyway, geologists really do that. They lick things. <laughs> Whether you're supposed to or not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Chemists and biologists don't lick things. They know better. <laughs> Um, speaking of planets, uh, the first one we want to talk about is a water planet, uh, Camino. We see this in Attack of the Clones. Um, let's talk about a little bit, what would a water planet entail? We've got uh, some people out here water. with fire. Water? <laughs> yeah, but luckily water's common, right? I mean, so we actually do see water commonly throughout the solar system, just normally not liquid water. You know, the Earth is the only planet in the solar system that has liquid water abundantly on the surface, but... Um, we do see moons uh, that harbor liquid water uh, oceans underneath their surfaces and have ice surfaces. Um, we estimate that for the Earth to look like a water world like Camino, we'd need about twice as much water as it has now. So we're not quite there. So I believe in Camino, their backstory is that they used to have continents and everything, and eventually everything got flooded out because of their localized climate change. Mm -hmm. If we melted all the ice caps on Earth, it would still only raise the water level about 230 feet, which would be detrimental to everything on the coasts, but in the long run, we'd still have land and that's not the problem. But Earth actually was at one time covered in water. Um, back the three plus billion years ago, the Earth was much, much hotter. And so all the water that can be stored inside the Earth wasn't able to because it was so hot. So all the water was on the surface enough to drown out Mount Everest. And so as the Earth started to cool, the inner parts of the, the mantle of the Earth actually absorbed a lot of the water, and so we have a lot less water on the surface now than we used to. Pretty cool. <laughs> All right, and so this would be the result of that, that they would just start building up to stay out of the water in you know, their large cities that just basically you just keep building up, and, and maybe it kind of looks like the Jetsons. You wonder if the, the Jetsons world is water underneath. There's this, you know, climate change on Earth. and It's like Venice. Kept they kept keep going up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one of the other things uh, we see about Camino is that Fawn built Camino. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, actually, we're looking at uh, a big chunk of the work that I was overseeing. So we had... Um, for this scene, we actually built the straight hallway, a curved hallway section, and then um, the uh, what we call the pod, which is the tower in the middle there. Um, and then they composited in uh, Obi-Wan and the, the Camino aliens walking down the hallways. This was actually, uh, from a science perspective, we actually utilize science in a different way than what we're talking about here in terms of the science fiction world. We actually utilize science in a day-to-day -day when we're making the miniatures. One of the most difficult parts of making this environment were those windows that you see there because we had to vacuum form those. Uh, they're really weird shapes, so we had to make patterns that were flawless, and then we had to vacuum form clear plastic over the top. One speck of dust landed on one of those windows, we would have to start all over again. So it was a very, very challenging thing. We made a lot, a lot of windows, and there were a lot of rejects to get all the windows for the scene. Um, another weird artifact of shooting this long hallway stuff is we had to, because a camera, when you're shooting miniatures, it's really hard to get long depth of field because you want to keep what's in the foreground focused. We actually had to shoot this in sections. So this image that you see here was never actually an image that we uh, got to see on stage because we would actually shoot the front uh, four feet and then we would take it away and then we would shoot the, everything beyond that front four feet so that all of it would look like it's in focus just like it would if it were full size. So there's a lot of interesting challenges when you're shooting miniatures that you wouldn't think of. Yeah. And then uh, what were they doing on Camino? They were, were making clones. So I figured this is Attack of the Clones. We should probably talk about clones. So go for it. Right. So this has not been done on our planet yet. And this, when you talk about cloning, you're not just talking about the biology of it. You're talking about the ethics. And you can't have one without the other. And, of course, lately we're talking a lot about biology and ethics and how scientists are coping with a lot of current changes in biotechnology and, and obviously a pandemic. So with cloning, we have animals that have been cloned, but it took a lot of tries. It's a messy science. Now, the aliens on Camino, they've got this down to a science and a fine art. And so they start with a clone of Django Fett. 
and they build upon that and they can grow these clones rapidly so that they reach maturity at age 10. That's not something that we can do with anything right now. We can't accelerate, you know, even if we can't even accelerate a, a primate, you know, there's a lot of sticky stuff inside the nuclei of primates. Then, you know, we've cloned sheep. We started with Dolly years ago, and even that took 277 tries. So then you get to the point where you're like, well, what's the point of doing something that takes this much work and this much time? And then you also need to have a host in our current technology. In this case, there's capsules that the, the fetuses are grown into larger sizes. So it's possible that we could do this one day, but the question is, why would we want to? It would be incredibly... Well, clone armies, clearly. <laughs> right, but the benefit of a clone army versus a droid army is something that, you know, you're running into, again, ethics here. You're like basically creating meat robots, but they have their own thoughts and they have their own feelings. And even if you were a twin, an identical twin, you're not the same person as your genetic twin. So there's a sticky situation there and nobody's done it in humanity yet. I don't think that we need to. Although so, there is also a debate as to whether or not sentient robots have rights as well. Exactly. There's been a few movies about that too. So what you're saying is that in The Rise of Skywalker, in real life, that vat would not have Snoke in it, it would have pieces of Dolly. <laughs> <laughs> It's too yeah. bad it wouldn't be Dolly Parton. In <laughs> she would have killed him. Uh, there, this is a very flawed system, just like you said, because even though um, the genetic altering is supposed to keep them uh, essentially identical in their um, experiences, they are in a social environment, which is each other. So there's going to be some individualistic uh, desires and needs and um, some idiosyncratic personalities that come out of this. They would definitely not be identical. And I think there's a series that handles this a little bit better than the film. Uh, oh, yeah. About a yeah. batch of them that maybe have gone bad or didn't yeah. quite. <laughs> Breaking bad batch. <laughs> Um, one of the other things is, as they're growing is, yeah, they have all these, you know, essentially twin brothers. I don't know if you have billion tuplets, I guess. Um, but what do they have in the way of parents and how might that affect them? Yeah, I mean, it, uh, the caregiver is uh, hugely important, especially in the, in the earlier stages, right? Somebody who's helping them develop their intellectual, moral, social, interpersonal, um, you know, kind of uh, the makeup. For, for who they are. So there, there will be some consequences for kind of being trained to be in the military and not really having that um, nurturing, comforting, uh, caregiving relationship. Um, but I, I think too, as they get older and into adulthood, um, that's where you'll see some of the psychological consequences of the, those early nascent, um, you know, kind of the, the lacking there, the, the risks happen early in life, and then later um, you might see some uh, consequences of, of that uh, lack of nurturing. What, what do you think some of those consequences could be? Well... <laughs> Going around killing everyone? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's actually quite um, relevant because they might be more prone to um, falling in line to this militant society, being willing to engage in violence. Um, you know, not having compassionate, um, uh, you know, uh, an operating system, if you will, that isn't compassionate. And, and, you know, that's very risky. I think, too, because of the accelerated growth, you're accelerating everything else, mm -hmm. including cognitive development, social behaviors and things like that. I don't think that's the best idea in the universe to have a 10 year old being of any age. I mean, you know, in, in this case, you got to think of kind of in dog years. Like it, we, we don't know how long these clones can actually live. We know that their growth is accelerated. They're mature at 10. How much can you fit in that 10 years versus a 20 years, a 20 year old regular human being? That's an acceleration. I mean, the only benefit there is maybe your teens go a lot faster, <laughs> you know, but other than that, you know, you're really cramming a lot in. And I can't see that like, on the one hand, if these are bred to be sort of more docile and you know, more pliable, beings, you know, to be able to accept. And of course, they have the chip for Order 66, they, you know, but if that's a lot to fit in a small time frame. And development of humans is known among all species as being historically longer 
than other animals. So you have the benefit of that with being an, an older person that you go through a longer development. But in this case, they're shoved out into the world ready to fight and kill. So it's not great. But they, they do avoid those awkward teenage years twice as fast. And then, then, then they get to see rated R movies when you know they're uh, eight and a half. <laughs> Though some of us in the 80s did that anyway. <laughs> All right, well, let's look at the dynamic. You know, Boba is the unaltered clone, and he's basically treated as the son, so he kind of has a, a very different upbringing. And so, you know, what do you think that family dynamic is? That, you know, is he a clone? Is he just the son? Or what do you think? Well, you know, having that unaltered uh, genetic makeup gives him more of those um, social, familial, interpersonal opportunities to grow and develop. Um, especially around that emotional piece that, that we've been saying might be lacking in some of the other clones. Um, but it's an interesting upbringing, you know, that he is um, surrounded by these clones that look exactly like him, and so he's trying to di differentiate himself from them. And, you know, that journey can be confusing. It can be, it, he can, in, in a weird way, can actually make him feel more alone. Um, because he's not like them, but he's almost exactly like them. Um, and then he has he has a caregiver who, um, you know, is um, present, but perhaps doesn't have the caregiving, nurturing, comforting elements that are important to help him develop and learn how to kind of have a regulated system. Well, yeah, his dad's job is to go around and kill people. <laughs> yeah, he, he learns that, that that's how you get around. That's how you survive. He didn't get enough hugs when he was young? I imagine not. Well, I, can you imagine the Kaminoans like, you know, patting and burping babies and such? No. No, exactly. They, they might have droids that do that. Yeah, I'm the dro diaper droid 3000. <laughs> Could have used that. So, you know, what, what is a theme in Attack of the Clones is that, you know, there, there are parents being lost, um, both on sort of the light side and the dark side, and we see how it affects them. Um, what is that, that cycle, the kind of that trauma that happens when you're you're younger and you lose a parent? Well, you know, the first thing that, that I think a lot of us know and, and grow to learn is that grief is different with everybody. Um, there's no one way to grieve. There's no one way to have, um, you know, any kind of like normal reaction following a loss. And, and we're talking about losses that are traumatic. You know, the witnessing, um, in one case, witnessing a, a very horrific murder of your parent. Um, the other, um, you know, uh, encountering a, a, a parent and watching them go through a torturous experience and, and passing away. It's, um, you know, these are traumatic events. And so um, there's a lot of, um, uh, there's almost a, a, a phasic sort of reaction where first there's a lot of um, shock, uh, then there's a lot of anger and um, you know, wanting to kind of you know lash out. I do have to say that with Anakin, there's a there's a um, presence of something called counterfactual thinking. So counter counterfactual thinking is kind of getting fixated on what should have happened, like and taking responsibility. Like, oh, I should. He even says, I should have been stronger. I should have done something different. I should have been there. And when something terrible happens to us we can get caught or fixated in this cycle of ruminations. I, I, should, I should have done something differently. And that self-blame and um, deep, oh Sorry. dear. Moved it. I, <laughs> Sorry, I, I was not ready to move. No, it. you're Sorry. good, you're good. Um, and we'll see some of this come up, right? This, this, these problems with regulating one's emotions in the case of grief he's already a pretty dysregulated guy and this horrific loss happens and his immediate reaction is a, an extreme self-blame and this, this essence of um, you know, really wanting to change the past and forecasting how in the future he's gonna have more agency and control. And as we know, you know, we sometimes do not have control or agency around loss. Yeah. I can speak to this on a very personal level. Um, two years from tomorrow, my father died suddenly during the pandemic, and I moved my family across the country to help the rest of my family. And it was a very shocking moment uh, for all of us. I don't think we'll truly ever be over it. Um, but I was ruminating. We were all ruminating. We all thought, 
was there something we could have done differently? And we just kept in that cycle. And finally, you know, a good friend of mine said, you know, don't let your power, cons- you know, the grief power consume you. And so I think in Anakin's case, he let it consume him. And I chose actively not to. And, you know, but there are always going to be questions of like, if I had known, you know, like if I could have done something and you have to just forgive yourself. We're not all knowing people. And Anakin is a powerful person, but even that's still true. You can't know everything and all you have is the love that you give. Yeah, and speaking of love, we, we have this you know, wonderful scene from, from uh, I, I don't think that was the exact dialogue in the film, but, uh, <laughs> but you know, apparently, it, it, yeah. Um, but, but okay, going on to them, their actual love that, that you know what what makes a relationship healthy when you have a guy that is raised basically you know no attachments and a girl that has like no peers that she can you know really have a relationship with you know she's a queen and a senator and so it's like does she get a chance to date much and so you know she's always higher up in in the system and so it's like how does that relationship work you know Go for it. Yikes. <laughs> this, is you, right? this is geology, right? Yeah, no, no. <laughs> uh, you know, in, in, any, in any dyad, you do need to consider um, the context of, of the people involved. And let me start with the strengths, okay? Which is that, um, you know, Padme is clearly a very compassionate, um, selfless person. Um, she has such a broad emotional intelligence. She's just incredibly forgiving. Very, very forgiving. Very forgiving. <laughs> um, and the trouble, you know, being completely candid here about Anakin, the trouble is that, as we've already talked about, he's very dysregulated emotionally. And I don't know that it's really healthy for him to be in any relationship at, at the time that he falls in love with her. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to talk about him in the context of this relationship. He is, he is a high-conflict person. It's called an HCP, somebody who has a high-conflict personality. It's not a diagnosis. It's not a mental health condition. But some, uh, some of us, about one in ten of us, are HCPs. We have difficulty um, feeling some intense emotions. Sometimes uh, we blame others. Um, with Anakin, he's extremely blameful, um, not only of himself, but um, actually more times than not of others. He even blames her for their kiss. You know, he's like, I'm haunted by these feelings because you kissed me. And if you actually look at the facts, it's, 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 that didn't happen that way. It's not something she did to him. And he's very blameful of her about their, his, the way he feels about her. Um, HCPs also... Uh, have this all or nothing thinking, so very black and white thinking, extreme fixated uh, range of um, you know cognitive repertoire where they aren't really flexible. And so when they're having these discussions, which could be around like, how can we make this relationship work? Um, how do we understand the rules and, and kind of the, uh, the, the social nature of um, us kind of falling for one another and, and maybe having a future together? Um, his way of interacting with her and his way of trying to develop something meaningful is just extremely all about him and he doesn't have it's interesting he says he's compassionate he believes compassion is kind of like how you're able to love others uh, as a Jedi he's not a very compassionate person though so he's confused about his own set of um, his own emotional repertoire and and other people that's the kindest way I can word this (laughs) (laughs) All right, we, we move from that very simple segue of, uh, yeah. But it's geology time. I like geology. <laughs> yeah, geology rocks. But do you like sand? But do you there, like sand? There's going to be more. Uh, I don't mind sand. I hear it's um, harsh, though, and it gets everywhere. Anyone who's been to a beach, it really does get everywhere. <laughs> So uh, when we're looking at the different planets, in Attack of the Clones, you even have two different types of desert planets. We have the, the Tatooine that's in almost every single movie um, and TV show. If you keep going back there. Um, why does everybody want to go back to Tatooine? Uh, 
um, and we have geonosis. So t Tatooine, most of what we see, we see these sand dunes. And that type of desert, the sand dunes themselves are called herbs. And it's basically a sand sea where the, the deserts um, basically kind of move. As the wind blows, the sand moves, and dunes actually move through the space that they're in. They're never static, um, which is part of the problem I had with Kenobi when he digs up the lightsabers. Mm -hmm. yeah. Spoiler alert. That wouldn't have been there. <laughs> wait, wait. I, I just thought of something. If they're called Urgs, does that mean the Tusken Raiders are just basically calling out sand dudes? Urg, 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 urg. <laughs> yes. <laughs> When we look at Geonosis now, it's a different type of desert. And des the word desert has a specific meaning. It means that you get less than five inches of rain a year. Doesn't matter temperature. Uh, there's hot deserts mm -hmm. and there's cold deserts. Mm -hmm. Antarctica is a desert um, because it doesn't get very much precipitation. Geonosis is also a desert. Um, I had, was looking up what Geonosis type of desert is. It said it was a hot desert, but it looks a lot like a cold desert where you have all the rock forms. Um, but the temperature wise, you don't have enough moisture to break down the rocks. And so you have, there's no loose sand really from what you can see. So everything, the wind scours everything. And um, you have a lot of very sharp edges. Uh, anyone who's been to Southern Utah, you can see very similar kind of um, uh, features where you have a lot of wind, but you don't have the sand there to, uh, to add it to the dunes. Well, and then Geonosis is surrounded by uh, rings. Um, how, how do rings work on planets? You know, it's this looks like an asteroid feel. So, okay, so yeah, when, when you're approaching this in the first shot, it looks a lot like the rings of Saturn. But the rings of Saturn are actually mostly made out of ices. And the differences that you see in the brightness versus the darkness is actually the density of the amount of ice in each of the rings, right? So you're just looking at particle density there. But then Django refers to this as an asteroid field. You get close to it and you're just like, yeah, these, these are rocks. And so I'm trying to figure out, like, it's one of the reasons why we think uh, icy rings are common in our solar system is that ice is lower density, so it would be easier to break up by gravitational or tidal forces. And so what would you need to get sort of a rocky ring system like this? You'd need some sort of collision, or you'd need a higher gravity, but none of the worlds in the Star Wars universe appear to have different gravities at all, as far as we can tell, because <laughs> everybody seems to be comfy everywhere they stand. So, um, it's because they don't go to the place they'd get squashed flat. Well, exactly. I actually, <laughs> I actually think you can justify it, but it has to be only worlds within a certain gravitational field range are, are, are habited. It's weird. It's just so weird. It's so <laughs> weird. It's so weird. But so could you have something like this in reality? Yes. Do we see it currently in our own solar system? No. We do see some dusty, rockier rings, uh, but not as fully fledged and pretty as this, but we actually see asteroids even that have their own ring system likely due to collisions. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty cool. It's wild. Yeah, and fun fact on the desert world thing, um, you can actually visit Tatooine here in California. Uh, in addition to shooting in Tunisia, they shot a lot of the scenes in Tatooine in uh, Death Valley and you can find them. I've been there. Yeah. It's really, really a fun field trip. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually leading some British fans out there uh, next week that they decided to choose late May because it's <laughs> so, hey, you know, it's not in the 120s, so <laughs> at least next week it won't be. Um, one of the other cool things that we see in the Rings of Geonosis is uh, this thing, which is probably one of the coolest sounds in Star Wars, um, as you can hear it right now. This is the silent part before you hear it. Um, but <laughs> there we go. <laughs> but but how would a, a weapon like this work? All right, I'll, I'll take that. So um, so they called it a seismic charge. Uh, seismic waves are just pressure waves. So, so you, or, or you can be pressure waves or transverse waves, right? But you can have uh, pressure waves. You can actually get shock waves uh, due to an explosion. We actually see astrophysical shock waves commonly in space, particularly around like supernovae uh, remnants. Uh, you might even be familiar with some astrophysical 
astrophysical shock waves that have happened here on Earth. Um, the Tunguska event um, from early in the 1900s is thought to have been a large, maybe cometary fragment or asteroid fragment that exploded high up in the atmosphere, and it's the shock wave that actually blasted away all those trees. And then more recently in 2013, the, the, the Chelyabinsk um, impact event uh, thousands of people got hurt in Chelyabinsk from this impact event, but not by the impactor, but from the shock wave that was set up uh, as that large sort of bus size, they estimated, meteor came through the atmosphere. And you can trigger a shock wave if the object is going faster than what they call the speed of sound in the medium that it's traveling through. The hard part about this image for this sequence is that you usually need um, more density, right? Um, there's big gaps between the rocks here, uh, but it isn't maybe as far-fetched as you might think, except for the sound. Uh, but I, the, the sound wouldn't travel, not a high enough density for it to travel. So I actually, what I really love about this is the absence of sound before the the, the boom or whatever noise it was. <laughs> yeah, the, the absence of sound before that was really great, and I love that. There we go. So, so we were kind of talking about sonic weapons. They, these would work more in atmosphere because you have that density of air. Mm -hmm. um, but do you think you could make something, you know, that handheld to uh, to blast it? I know that they're they're trying to do that with as firefighting equipment. So there actually are sonic weapons. There are acoustic weapons that are currently used. They're called LRAD, uh, long range acoustic devices. They uh, were developed by the military for combat, um, but yet they're being used to disperse uh, protesters and they're being called non-lethal. And I would really argue that you should protest that notion. They can, seriously, it, they can cause, they can shatter eardrums, they cause severe pain, can severe nausea, they can cause permanent hearing loss. Uh, just because it doesn't kill you doesn't mean it can't hurt you. And so um, as, as all of us in this room should be aware, sometimes you must resist resist the thinking that those are peaceful weapons. I just got it to rebel a little here. No, that's okay. Um, and then we, we, we get into the droid factory and, you know, Fawn, you had a hand in that. I did. Actually, it's funny you pull this up because this is the scene that one of the scenes that I worked on. Um, this walkway, in actuality, is only about nine inches wide, about six inches tall. We did do 16 feet of it. Um, and then the R2-D2 was comped in later by Billy Brooks, who I'll be doing a panel with tomorrow. <laughs> um, that was the first uh, time we got to see R2-D2 fly. Um, this scene was very exciting to see in the film because when we shot it, like I said, the scale was uh, similar to about 1 18th, about action figure scale for this. And then so when... Um, Padme got dumped out onto the, the little disc from one of these cauldrons. Um, that disc was only about two feet in diameter. And we got right, right, right on close to it. Those are always the most terrifying scenes to work on as a model maker because obviously the further you get away from a model, the, the less you have to worry about how good it looks. So um, <laughs> we were really always very happy with the way this turns out. It looks, it looks correct. <laughs> how how did you get Natalie Portman to land on a disc two feet wide? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you dump her on a green screen, and she magically appears on your miniature. <laughs> it looks like there's handrails, though, in that shot. Uh, oh. Yeah, she, well, she was inside one of the cauldrons and got dumped out. R2 is safely within the rails. <laughs> this was actually really fun, because in, in Attack of the Clones, this is the first time we actually worked very closely with the previs department. Uh, they would create these really uh, elaborate animatics of what the scenes were going to look like in the movie. And then we would get those animatics. Um, usually, before this movie, we got them on VHS tape, and we would just watch them. <laughs> but on this movie, we actually got the Maya files. We were able to extract the computer models from the Maya file. We would build our miniatures exactly to the size and shape of what's in the animatic. And then we would hand that information off all of our details and laser cut files, CNC files, all that kind of stuff, to the CG department. So what they built and what we built were perfectly matched. And then of course, when we got out to stage, we were shooting with motion control cameras. So uh, there was someone who would translate the motion control, uh, the, I'm sorry, the animatic camera move to the motion control camera, scaled to the miniature that we built. And every, every single department was able to work flawlessly, which meant we were able to work very quickly which on this movie we had to do because we were shooting digital, which also sped up the filmmaking process. It was the first all digital feature film. Um, 
Phantom Menace and everything before that was shot with film. When we shot digitally, it meant we could actually shoot a scene and then look at it that very same moment and then move to the next scene. So we started doing maybe uh, over 20 shots a day when previously we would shoot one shot. We'd wait for the film to get developed, we'd watch it the next day, and then we'd maybe shoot that same shot again or maybe move on to another shot. So the filmmaking process um, just got a lot faster from Attack of the Clones forward. And that collaboration between departments really helped in uh, elevating the quality of movies. It was a really fun, fun movie to work on. It was groundbreaking in many ways. Uh, wh what other parts of uh, Geonosis did you work on? Oh man, we just did lots of rocks, as you could imagine. <laughs> lots of rocks. And these miniatures were not small. This one, the, the rock wall that had the, the columns and stuff on it was, um, I want to say about 12 feet tall. So, and then we had, we had some pieces of Geonosis that were up to 15 feet tall and 30 feet long. Um, yeah, it was, it was a massive amount of work. And then the arena, of course, took up an entire stage. Um, and that was all miniature. And, and speaking of the arena, we have these really cool beasts. Who, who likes the, the Ackley the most? Okay, like four of you. Okay, uh, who likes the, the, the Reek the most? Okay, more. Wait, wow. I, I'm an Ackley fan. I feel hurt. Who likes the Nexu the most? Yeah, that's what I thought. That, uh, kitty. It's a nice, friendly kitty. <laughs> it, see, look, it's smiling. We know, and we would totally pet it and be instantly destroyed. Yeah, so, so you know, tell us about what we think these creatures could be like. Anybody. Well, I think one one thing that I thought that Nexu is is basically like a big cat, like you know, there, there's fur, there's teeth, there's the tail, and all this. But one of the things that struck me as interesting is why you would choose that as an arena beast because they are kind of delicate compared to the other animals. And um, you know, Reek is an herbivore most of the time, but can transform into a carnivore when it's hungry enough, as I understand it. Yep. But most of the time, it's like a giant rhino. But Nexu. I don't know. I it's vicious with the teeth. You gotta admire those teeth. You know they smile well. But I just I'm still even though they can scratch, they obviously tear patinies. Sure, in a very stylistic manner, <laughs> uh, just so. But I don't know. I wouldn't have chosen them for an arena beast because they seem a little too delicate to me, if, compared to the Ackley especially. I always attribute the Nexu to like a saber tooth tiger though. Yeah. And so much. they are very much not. A delicate beast, um, especially some of the the older ones are very robust, very beefy animals. Um, and so, despite it looking delicate, I feel like it's relative to the other two. Relative to the other two, mm -hmm. definitely. But, not to but you also have the ability where the next two can climb if, if you need it yeah. and stuff. And so you have a kind of a very wide array of animals. You have Although, the 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 bull running through things. You have the acolyte. Stabbing things. <laughs> and then the Nexu just cleans up the mess. But you can ride, you could tame a Nexu, probably. Maybe. Just it like you definitely tame looks a cat. like it likes to cuddle. Yeah. <laughs> we'd, we'd try to do that. But she, you know, you're able to jump on it at least and do something. But... Are, are these, do you know if these, um, uh, their, uh, how should I, their temperaments? <laughs> Are these their natural temperaments? And so other, in, their, in their other kind of environmental contexts, are they this vicious? From what I'm aware, most animals generally are not vicious yeah. animals. They're, they hunt, they get their food. They're not, unlike humans, humans really are the only ones who do things um, selfishly. Like animals will hunt and get their food, but they're not vicious about it. Mm. So, these, so these, these little guys have been like stabbed and prodded enough to get quite angry yes. and attack people. Gotcha. I mean, I think, you know, animals have a broad range of behaviors and there are instances in the animal kingdom other than humanity in which you do have some, some sparring going on. You know, like I've seen pet birds just go at each other because one of them wants a sunflower kernel that's not giving up. And, you know, if you waited a couple more minutes, there might be blood. So it's kind of like having toddlers with, with weapons in their mouths <laughs> so to watch them. So I think that, but in this case, they're put in an artificial environment in which they are not adapted to. They're not from there. They're not native to that place. They're not adapted to it, but they're made to kill, you know, and that's another ethics situation that we ran into with the clones. It's like, how right is this? This is not, not good in any situation to put them in this 
provocative mode in which they are made to be the aggressors. And, you know, it's just, they just are probably not even fed well. Who knows? But, you know. Well, we've seen the same thing in our own history with the Coliseum. Exactly. Gladiatorial battles. You Lions. put animals that are, like, constantly abused. Uh, dog yeah. fights the same way. Oh, and cock fights. It's awful. Yeah. Awful it, stuff. They're, they're, it's not their natural indication to yeah. attack. Like, yes, they're going to fight over food because food is essential to their life. Right. Um, killing the guy randomly that happens to be in the same room with you, probably not. Right. <laughs> Yeah, you know, this is not this is not behavior that you would see in their native environments. All right, now we move on to the Battle of Geonosis. Um, there's a lot going on in here uh, that you know. There's all kinds of weapons being used. You know, lots of different ships and vehicles and droids and clones. Um, you know, how does that work? Like from a physics perspective, like are these realistic motions um, for the weapons or the vehicles or anything? <laughs> I, I, that is just such an overwhelming battle sequence. There's all sorts of stuff going on. I mean, it looks like there's an atmosphere, so you should be able to have stuff in flight. Um, can't speak to the laser weapons, right? And long range laser, but that, that's a whole separate issue there. Um, just in terms of the motions, right, it seems like pretty standard group troop uh, war warfare in terms of the way the platoons and stuff are out there. In fact, my, my favorite part of the scene actually is when Padme starts ordering some of the clone troopers around and they're just like, I recognize a natural leader when I see one and they start following <laughs> what she says. But um, in terms of they have an atmosphere, so you should be able to hear explosions. Uh, we're assuming that there's oxygen in the atmosphere, so you can see flame and fire. And so the, from that aspect, the physics works. Just don't get me started on the laser weapons again. I yeah, think you're let's get talk about the, the laser, laser weapons. weapons. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we don't have those currently. Sorry. Sorry. I mean, like right now, um, the lasers are directed light beams and they can go through each other and if you direct one at something long enough it can impart enough energy to cause something to heat up but um, of, we'll just say like possible far future or a long time ago maybe but not currently with our own tech so they're basically playing with flashlights and yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah like, the, like they would go right through each other Right. I think, I think technically they're not lasers. They've kind of explained some of that away. Yeah. They're energy weapons. Right. And so they shoot a bolt of energy because obviously yeah. a laser would be a continuous line from the gun to the target. So that's the way they've explained out blasters. Yeah. I have friends that know way more about this than I do. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> but I remember hearing this. Yeah. yeah. But technically, light can impart momentum, and so if you've ever seen, oh, like like uh, Count Dooku's yacht in this movie where you have like the, the light sail, the solar sail, right? Uh, and the, those things actually, the Planetary Society tested one in orbit around the Earth in recent years where it unfurled a solar sail and got some of the light from the sun to actually impart momentum to it. So that actually can happen. You can wow. have light impart. We just currently with our own tech, uh, I, I, I'm not going to knock you over with it. That, that's, just, that's just what I'm saying. That's really cool. I had no idea that, that we could sail. do solar sail technology. So solar sail technology just involves gigantic sails, which is why Duke would unfurls. The idea of it, of it unfurling that big makes sense. And that the fact that to actually travel anywhere like through hyperspace or actually uh, in atmosphere that you would have to retract it. Totally. That, yeah, that, that's actually stuff that was based on things that were um, in development and possible at the time. Cool. Yeah. And then, you know, we, we talk in you know, the Solar Sailor, we also have other starships going on. Um, I, I think this is somebody we know. <laughs> He's very handsome. <laughs> Much younger than I am, though. <laughs> yeah, this was for um, one of the, oh boy, it was a Trade Federation ship uh, that was uh, trying to take off and it got hit in the, the fuel tanks. Uh, were knocked over, so we actually built a bunch of these fuel tanks. These are pyro models, so they're built with specific locations for uh, the explosion to um, occur. So, and then we would shoot those in high speed with uh, Jeff Heron and his pyro crew. So that was a lot of fun, actually. And those we blew them up and then dropped them on the camera. 
<laughs> Towards the camera. <laughs> but, but did you have to you know, do those all in one take, or otherwise you'd have to build a whole new set? Uh, we actually built a lot of those. Um, we used to do uh, three takes for every pyro shot, and we would watch those takes and see which one, uh, we'd just pick the best of three. Uh, sometimes we'd only do two because one of those first two is so good that you just don't feel necessary to shoot a third. Uh, these days, we, uh, with digital photography where it's at, we actually do only do one take, but we'll put like seven cameras on it and one of the angles will look really, really good. Uh, sometimes all the angles, and then you just stretch out the explosion uh, in the edit. Um, but yeah, it, it, blowing stuff up is definitely one of the most fun parts about the job. <laughs> I, I would highly recommend it. <laughs> with the professionals, of course. Um, Don't try and kids, ask yeah, your yeah. parents before you blow things up. <laughs> So, so did you load up those things? You, you know, obviously put the pyro stuff in. Did you load them up with other material too? Yes, yeah, it's actually a really fun fact. Uh, good fun fact. Um, we, when we make pyro models, uh, it's the physics of shooting film. So when you shoot video or, or film, it's uh, capturing a series of images. And so the debris from an explosion can actually fly past the camera between those images, between the pictures. So what you end up doing is you have to load a lot more debris inside the model than you actually think you would need. So they're, they're in person, they just vomit a massive amount of material. And so in order to do that, we usually load them up with pasta because it's very inexpensive, it breaks well, it's got some really nice shapes. So we just put out a bunch of pasta, we'll spray paint it black. And then you can use it afterwards gray. when you're done. <laughs> <laughs> Charred a little. Um, yeah, the pyro has a weird smell to it. When it's when it's done, there's it's almost like a mothball smell. I, I'm not sure what components in the the pyro process uh, generate that smell, but the models are usually and the pasta's not great once it smells like mothballs. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we load a lot of this debris you see flying by camera in these shots is uh, pasta. So you could say that's maybe pasta with a carbonara sauce. <laughs> the flying spaghetti monster is real. Oh, flying cool. spaghetti monster is real. Wow. <laughs> I'm not the only one with the, the dad jokes up here. Um, you got the mom jokes going. <laughs> uh, this is another guy you might know. This is uh, Grant Imahara working on Coruscant. Um, yeah, let's give him a round. So you also worked on these, right? Oh yeah, yeah. No? I did a lot of the Jedi Temple stuff for Coruscant. Uh, and then uh, we actually, the first buildings we built for Coruscant were for the special editions. Um, the, the, we needed to create examples of what those buildings might look like for the CG team. Uh, it's a common practice in, in motion pictures for us to build miniatures and photograph them. Even if they're not, they don't end up in the movie, those photographs are really uh, useful for the CG modelers to create something that looks real because we've created something that's real. So, um, and there was a ton of work on Coruscant, of course, because there were many, many, many buildings in that, in that movie. Yep, here, here's another shot of them working together. Um, is, is the thing on the bottom left, is that Dex's Diner? It is. Yeah, oh. Dex's Diner was a miniature. Um, the industrial park was a miniature. Jedi Temple interior and exteriors were miniatures. There were a massive amount of miniatures in the prequels. That's actually what we'll be talking about tomorrow. Cool. Yeah, come check it out. Um, let's see. Oh, we got this one. Uh, mm. Lisa specifically asked for this slide to be in here. Even, even I didn't even realize you asked for the slide. I didn't know the slide was there. And I'm like, oh, we should talk about this. I, I think Lisa would be perfect I, for I, it. I, 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 I loved this so much. Because with the exception of Salty in The Last Jedi, this is like the only other time I can think of science actually happening on screen in Star Wars. <laughs> By the way, I love Salty in The Last Jedi. I they didn't lick this one, though. No, they didn't lick, they didn't lick this. But, but I love the phrase, gravity silhouette remains because we actually um, do look for objects uh, out in space uh, by how their gravity affects other things. I mean, until the last you know several years where we've been able to detect gravitational waves from black holes, we detected black holes by how they affected them with things around them. 
Um, and uh, a little bit closer to home in our own solar system, there is currently an ongoing search for something called Planet Nine, because Pluto's not a planet. Pluto's in a place, better place now. Don't talk about Pluto. Um, we don't uh, talk about Pluto. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. That was so going through my mind in that whole movie. Um, but um, there is a search for a large object out in the Kuiper Belt, because there are some... The Kuiper Belt is a large sort of donut-shaped ring of objects that starts at the orbit of Neptune. And the the orbits of a couple of the objects out there don't behave quite right, but if there is another large object out there that we haven't seen yet, it could actually be the, the one doing the thing. Uh, and so there is an ongoing search for another large object out in the Kuiper Belt because of something that is behaving like gravity's silhouette. I did have a question when I was sitting uh, watching the movie, is we have an instance where we have a planet that is no longer there because um, it got blowed up. Um, how long would that gravity silhouette remain after the object is removed? Oh, that's a really great question. So if um, we blew up Alderaan or something like that, um, uh, actually... We? <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> um, Anyway, so um, so one of the interesting things, general relativity predicts that gravity should also travel at the speed of light. And so in 2015, when we first detected gravitational waves for the first time, that was actually one of the things that was verified. And so just like if the sun had, if the sun blew up five minutes ago, we'd find out three minutes from now. Like that's the sort of thing that should always give you nightmares because it's fun. Um, uh, same thing about uh, if the earth blew up the moon would have like uh, 1.3 seconds before it noticed our gravity going away. I love talking about this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but that leads into, uh, you know, maybe, you know, the, the, the planet was removed, you know, from the archives, but, you know, what would, what would that be like having a, basically a giant database and, and sneaking that out and no one noticing. I know we, we have lots of computer scientists up here, but uh, anyone take a stab at it. But we, we see this used a couple times, actually. We also see this in Rebels, um, the best Star Wars, when... Um, <laughs> it's true. But, but when Thrawn helps isolate the area where the Rebel base is, you know, um, Callus had tried to remove it from this database, but Thrawn could still tell by the way other things were... He triangulated other things, and... It would be really hard, and you would need somebody with access to something. I mean, that is an inside job, right? A Jedi had to do that, and I, I think of someone with that power. So to me, that was actually one of the things in that movie, because I'm a nerd, and I've always been a nerd. I was like, wow, for someone to do that, they would have had to have had access to a lot of powerful databases. And I, I, Yeah, that was cool. I don't know. I delete things off my computer a lot. I just I'm trying to plan it and delete. <laughs> <laughs> Um, switching gears from, from uh, <laughs> database stuff, uh, we, we have lots of different alien species, and they're, they're all kind of different. Um, these are the Geonosians, and we can see that there's kind of different types. Poggle the Lesser um, is the one seated on, seated on the right, and he looks very different from these ones that have the wings flying around. Um, what do you think that is like? I would think those wings would not be adequate to lift that size of a body in proportion to the size of the wing. That's my opinion. <laughs> it, it's low gravity. <laughs> Well, I didn't know. <laughs> but nobody's jumping high. Nobody's jumping high. I find the different aliens interesting because, like, when you think of evolution as a general sense, we are only here because a big asteroid hit the Earth 66 million years ago. If that didn't happen, we wouldn't be here because dinosaurs and birds um, would still be in, in, in power, mm -hmm. um, and they would have their own system of governments. And and so, like, trying to, like, piece out if you had the same start but different things happened, would you get giant bug people? Would you get other things? Um, the biggest problem about bugs is that on Earth, when we had a lot more oxygen in the atmosphere, um, insects get their oxygen kind of through their body. And so you need a very high oxygen content for insects to live when you have a lower um, oxygen level, insects can't get as big. So back in what's called the Carboniferous, insects got really big because they had a lot of oxygen. Um, compared to now, when we don't have as much oxygen, insects can't get nearly the size that they used to. 
So that the giant the giant bugs here could indicate the oxygen levels on Geonosis. Uh, that's really interesting. I never thought of that because the Earth is the only planet in the solar system that has such large amounts of free oxygen in the atmosphere, and that's because it biological organism out outgassed it. And so you're just basically saying you couldn't have bugs on Mars because of the low amount of oxygen in the atmosphere. So like the Earth is the only place in the solar system you can have bugs is what you've just told us. And, and we're lucky enough to have the bugs. <laughs> yes. But what you're saying is Earth did not originally have a large amount of oxygen. It was all the bacteria that slowly evolved and basically the bacteria made a planet that they couldn't live on. Yes. Because they produced all the oxygen, and so they mostly died off because they made their own death. They terraformed themselves into extinction. Well, yes. Oh, well, it is something Along with some asteroids. It, it is something that I talk about when we discuss climate change in my astro classes and my physics classes. Is that we already live in a secondary or a tertiary atmosphere for the Earth. This is not the atmosphere we formed with. So if you don't think living creatures can have a large scale effect on an atmosphere, um, you're not right. <laughs> <laughs> it's already happened. Um, I don't know, looking at, at these aliens, the uh, Sand Hill, the uh, moon, and then uh, Shumai, yes, named after the, the dim sum dish, uh, the Gossam. Uh, what, what do you think we can tell about their planets or their biology mm -hmm. just from, from their looks? Or we're going to move on. Uh, I'm sure. <laughs> I've got nothing on that one. Yeah, nothing. I don't know. That's a, quite the cranium on the one. Generally, most of the creatures we see are bipedal. And obviously, that's an innate bias on our own right. um, self. Because even George Lucas said, you want things that are just old, familiar enough that we can latch onto it. So obviously, your intelligent species should look in general proportions to us. And so that's why you have the moon and the sun. That actually was one of the rules that we had when we were working on the films is anything that we made for the movies had to be recognizable within a few seconds. So that's probably one of the reasons they stuck to humanoid type aliens, just to make it really easy to recognize what you're looking at immediately. They make good toys too. <laughs> now, uh, and then here we have sort of the, the Watt Tambor, the, the Skakowin uh, from the Techno Union, and he's kind of a, a com combination of man and machine, which is- Cyberman. A, you're right, he looks very much like a Cyberman from uh, Doctor Who, but you know, how does that interface work? You know, we see that throughout the films, bionic hands and, and cybernetic bodies. This is, a, this is a series in which it's early established that we have a cyborg villain you know, from the original film, Darth Vader. And so uh, the cybernetics of this universe must be rampant because so many creatures have it and whether or not they would need it or would have developed a better technology to have taken care of different situations is up for debate. But, you know, perhaps this is just what they figured out worked for them in their technological development and they ran with it versus any sort of organic compromise. Well, I believe the, the uh, also the skeptic the, the uh, Watt Tambor, I'm not pronouncing the species, um, shows that different uh, gravities, because I believe he's wearing the suit because the gravity of his own planet is a lot lower? So he's I think, weighing or, himself down with the suit. Yeah, because I think when you take him out of the suit, he explodes. That would be bad. <laughs> it's an encounter suit. I believe he's also from the planet that invented techno music. <laughs> oh, man. That's the name Techno Union. Wow. Death Which is punk. his band name. How long were you waiting to do that? <laughs> Every time I see that character, that's the first thing I think. <laughs> you, you've now been holding on to that for 20 years, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> One of those is a volume knob. You know it, right? Yeah. Yeah, you hear him adjust. He's got some feedback there, so. <laughs> and then we get kind of the other end. We have the... Camino winds, um, and they're super tall and lithe. And so what do you think that says about their world, especially now that their world's underwater? Well, they originally evolved on land, didn't they? I believe that's what the, that's what the, the, the history tells is. They, us. Yeah, they, wa they yeah. watered themselves out. Which is interesting. They're obviously long and slender, which makes me think that they needed to reach something. Kind of like a giraffe. <laughs> if they have a long neck, they're reaching. I don't know. Actually, a giraffe has been, doesn't have a long neck to reach things high. It's their battle. They use it as a weapon. Giraffes so eat so most, efficient. Yeah, giraffes eat mostly at grass. 
so many things in our in our <laughs> evolution seem to make little sense until you do dig deep. You know, pandas kind of being ridiculous examples of how did they even make it this far? <laughs> anyway, the power of cute. Uh, <laughs> so I wondered about the the. I like Kaminoans, that pronunciation. Um, I wondered if they are clones of themselves. Good and question. so they have been genetically manipulating their own Same biology brain. through time. I kind of like, too, that they kind of look like the classic UFO gray aliens. So I have this fantasy where, like, oh, they've been to Earth and they've manipulated us, you know, and that has to be part of the design, surely. So we're all clones. <gasps> Spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> This is another fun fact. That image there is uh, Oops, sorry, the, not that the office. prime minister's office is also a miniature. It's about eight feet across, and what looks to be uh, CG lighting was actually a uh, illuminated milkplex. It wow. was just kind of blown cool. out to camera. And then the floor glowed as well. All the rings on the floor were all practical. Wow. Yeah. Fun, yeah. fun fact. <laughs> the, the, those chairs always reminded me of like the little spoons in Chinese restaurants. Did you, would you just use some of those as uh, the set? These are the most expensive ladles I've ever made. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we got one more alien here and then we'll get to some questions. We have the Verk. Uh, you see him very briefly. It's uh, His name is Coleman Trevor. Um, and, and you see him, he, uh, he falls. He, he's, he's sleepy. <laughs> Um, you know, he's kind of like a, a hadrosaur, I think, maybe. Could be. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're thinking, you're thinking the the parasaurial office with oh. the, uh, the the crest. Sure, we'll go with that. <laughs> <laughs> That's all you want to say about that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, what would what would be the benefit of that crest, in your opinion? Um, so the parasaurial office use it as like um, talking. They they. They can call, they can mate. Um, a lot of, pretty much when you think of the animal kingdom, almost every part of an animal is because they, they're mating. Like it, it's naturally, it's a, the selection for mating. Um, some of it's defense, but even then it's for mating. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, that wraps up our main part of the presentation, but if you want to do Q and A, we can do that. I just want to remind you all that, uh, you know, if, if you like this set, this episode, this uh, this panel, and want to share it with your Click friends. Sign and subscribe <laughs> and like. Um, <clears throat> but yes, this this will be up on uh, Star Wars Ologies. That, that Star, and then Wars Ologies is a separate word. Uh, it's part of the Skywalking Network of podcasts. You can find it on uh, iTunes and Libsyn and, and Spotify and such. Um, but why don't we get into? Uh, this is where you can find us on social media. Um, so you know, connect with us, talk to us make dad jokes at me. Um, and Jim, you can do that too. What's that? It's my secret power. And mom jokes. And mom jokes. I am the ultimate pun queen, so follow me for terrible puns, <laughs> among other things. Um, but are, are, do we have any questions, some burning questions from Attack of the Clones? Uh, we'll get the handheld mic uh, right here. I think it's yeah. on the, the yeah. Less of Attack of the Clones question, but what is like the next R&D in each of your fields that you guys are just so excited for the Ooh. next generation to have? That's a really good question. Um, for us, we, we just uh, got two Stratasys J55 machines. They're 3D printers that can now print uh, very high resolution in color, and they just came out with a water-soluble um, support material. So that is our Ooh. latest technology cool. that we're really, really, yeah, really cool. enjoying right now. <laughs> like, probably more fun than we're supposed to have at work. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, 3D printing is definitely um, uh, moving in, uh, moving us into the future in a big, big way, and then also large format printing has become a um, a really great tool for us. It's it's really it's funny because uh, we thought that three D printing would evolve the our industry uh, much quicker than it did, but we're just now getting to where we thought we'd be about a decade ago. In genetics, we are encountering a revolution thanks to CRISPR and other gene editing tools. CRISPR is a way of kind of splicing out things, and then there's other technology that builds upon it. I actually work for a startup that is kind of going the opposite direction, making Chromavert. So we're, we're rapidly doing cell engineering at an accelerated pace. So this is kind of a fun topic to kind of segue from Attack of the Clones. That who knows where this is going to take us, but it will definitely help us solve a lot of problems a lot faster. See ya.
JWST, which is the infrared telescope that was launched in Jan, excuse me, in December, has gone through all of its science checks, its mirror alignments, and it is ready to go. And we should be seeing images anytime now. So I'd say the intersections of psychological science and artificial intelligence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So just looking at paleontology, if you've watched the Jurassic Park movies, um, they're finally catching up with the science by putting feathers on the dinosaurs because, yes. um, <laughs> because it's been known for a really long time that dinosaurs are birds, yes. or birds are dinosaurs. Yes. And so as we find more and more examples to support this, Jurassic Park, the original Jurassic Park was fine for its time. It actually was fairly um, accurate, but it quickly got out of date because science is always moving forwards. And so the new Jurassic Park, I hope they don't mess it up. Um, <laughs> but we actually are starting to see the correct representations of what we think right now would dinosaurs look like. Well, that was a really good question that led all of our, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll yeah. give you five bucks later. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. What about, you? What about me? Um, I don't know. I, I think my, my podcast will keep uh, evolving and, and getting cool, <laughs> cool uh, guests, um, and hopefully I'll keep writing Star Wars stuff. <laughs> um, if you are interested, there is... Oh, thank you. Um, if you can just scan that code there to get straight to our uh, Star Wars Ologies uh, page. Um, yep, go for that. All right, we'll give you guys a moment. Are there any other questions? Uh, yeah, just come up to the microphone up front. Don't be, don't be shy that you've got something burning deep. We, we can answer it or we can make up answers. I wanted to ask about the gravity waves. When a planet blows up, none of the mass is necessarily destroyed. Um, how does that affect and create a gravity wave if no mass is removed? Okay, so the question was about, uh, do planets blowing up create gravitational waves? Now, what's interesting is that the large-scale gravitational waves that we can detect come from interactions, and that we're noticing the changes, like the, the ripples that you see, if you've ever noticed any of like the publications, uh, like when it makes the front page of the New York Times, you're seeing ripples, and that's because there's two objects orbiting each other, and we're noticing the gravitational waves from their interactions. And so these sorts of gravitational waves of a single object maybe exploding aren't the ones we would necessarily pick up because you need huge masses um, for us to detect them. And so what would happen, though, is that the gravitational field would overall get weaker because the mass concentration isn't there anymore. It's dispersed. Good question. Good question. All right. Go for it. Uh, hi. So I want to ask you, Lisa, um, about physics. So this is a general Star Wars question. Uh, so Einstein said according to general, to special relativity, uh, a massive particle cannot travel at light speed. So how do you think light speed works? In <laughs> how, do I, how do I think light speed works? Well, according to the laws of physics as we currently understand it, it doesn't. Um, so I, that's part of my brain that I just always turn off to enjoy Star Wars. Um, <laughs> and, and so when you see some other like properties, like in Star Trek where they have the wormholes and things like that, uh, general relativity allows for the presence of wormholes. And perhaps for every black hole, there could be a white hole connected by something called an Einstein Frozen bridge, but you wouldn't survive your travel through it, so that's kind of a bummer. But that's actually like most of the time when we talk about warp drive, they're actually talking about warping space, bringing those two points in space closer together so that they don't actually have to travel faster than light. That's one of those ways. So for you can't accelerate to light speed, but from what I've heard is they kind of skip that step. They skip that step, step but uh, relativity says anything that has mass would need an infinite amount of energy to travel at the speed of light. So anything with mass, even an electron, could not go at the speed of light. Well, that kind of makes sense with the trade routes, that, that maybe those are places where, where space is easier to pull together to jump through. And, it's like... and this is part of why the Kessel Run thing never bothered me. <laughs> All, right. <laughs> All right, we got one more. Hi. Um do this. Hi. So this is kind of an alien physiology question. There's like four different kind of aquatic species throughout the things. There's Gungans and then there's Kit Fisto and stuff. And 
Throughout like the movies and the TV shows, they often go to other worlds and swim in other waters. So I guess my question is, what is the likelihood that every world would have the same like water composition mm-hmm. versus like salt water or not salt water? And yeah. then what is the likelihood that other species could survive for a smaller period of time in other water compositions? Probably not very likely. Okay. Any more than you would expect to pick up a manta from a saltwater area and drop it in a, a freshwater lake. It's just not going to work. But that is a really good question yeah. to ask also tomorrow at our Galactic Critters Big and Small <laughs> panel. <laughs> uh, this is, I'm short, I'm sorry. Uh, this is more one of the questions. You were talking about like creating the clones and the kind of psychological aspects, but also like the biology behind it. And then in episode nine, uh, Kylo and I forget his name, but they kind of talk about how Finn like broke away and about how they kidnapped children at that point and were psychologically conditioning them. And Kylo talks about how we should have just gone with the clone army. So what would be the benefits or the drawbacks of them choosing to go with the clone army that can do what like Order 66 versus potentially an army like we see in, you know, The Force Awakens that they're feeding them, having them grow up and training soldiers that way. Well, in the case of the clones, they are designed genetically to be of a certain kind of personality. So their genes are going to express a certain way. All of them across the board, you, you have consistency. And if you're, if, you're, if you're making an army, you want them to behave a certain way. In this case, across the board consistently the clone is the way to go unless you have that chip in there and but with you know with Finn a regular human being who's you know got a mix of of genes that has come through normal reproduction you know that's a very different situation so like the normal stormtroopers that came after the clones were out of the picture you know those are just regular human beings and they're going to have a whole different set of personalities and expressions, but even with the clones, you would do as well. So there's a lot of complicated gene stuff happening with the clones that just didn't have with regular stormtroopers. And the clones were better shots. <laughs> we also have the issue where the the stormtroopers, like Finn, are exactly the same as the Jedi. You pick up the children and you train the children within the dogma that you want to um, instill with them. The stormtroopers are doing the exact same thing. So you have that issue already in the prequel area. Yeah, that's true. All right. Uh, let's uh, once again just uh, thank you all for coming to Science of the Attack of the Clone. And that's all from the panel. I recommend that you follow Melissa and James at Star Wars Ologies. Uh, they can be found as part of the Skywalking Network or just their Star Wars Ologies podcast. I think they're on Twitter at Star Wars Ologies. Uh, you can also find us. You can email us, TalkinTauntauns, at AIPTcomics.com. You can find us on Twitter at TalkinTauntauns. Uh, you can join our Patreon and our Discord through AIPT Comics. And until then, uh, we'll see you again next week. Thank you.